All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Ayers Vineyard with Brad McElroy. It's uh, November 20th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining us today, Brad. We appreciate this. Thank you for having me. Uh, first question, most important question, why wine? Why wine? You know, um, I came about this kind of a long story. Um, I grew up in the Midwest and my family was in the retail trade. So I was exposed to wines and spirits and beer. Um, and then upon graduation from college, I went to the University of Colorado, I fell in love with wine. And I fell in love with the aspect of the travel, the great food, and just culturally you could experience so many different things that, that I might not have been exposed to in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. So from that came uh, the education. So, you know, with wine, regardless of what you know, you, you cannot know, know it all. So it was like one of those things that you know, was a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and then from that through travel, um, visiting Oregon in the early 90s, and just was in awe of what was going on out here. And um, came up with a crazy plan, and my wife and I decided to jump, and we moved here in 2000. So back up for a second, I'm, I'm curious about, you talk about falling in love with wine, but you talk about more about falling in love with the, the travel, cultural aspects of it. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the, be the beverage itself? Did it also, was, did it appeal to you? And did you, did you think at that point about making it or was it more about enjoying it? You know, it was, first it was enjoyment and uh, through my profession it was selling. Um, but then through the travel and experiencing firsthand what it took to grow the grapes, to make the wine, I was just in awe. And uh, not growing up in an agricultural background, um, became friends with people that were doing it. And then just was enamored with the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that just decided this is something that we wanted to pursue. So when you were, before you came here, you were doing wine retail. Tell me about that, that experience and about learning wine from that perspective. Sure, you know, as, as one works retail, you get the great opportunity to try wine of the world because everyone is always selling. And you know, that's one thing that I really miss upon those, those times is the, the ability to taste wine of the world. And you know, my passion is Pinot Noir, but I, I love wine. So um, with that said, you know, drinking wine from Italy, Spain, Portugal, you know, you name it, uh, when you can go visit different wine regions, I mean, you get, you get travel and then you get immersed you know, it makes us realize that the world is a very big place. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important for people to learn. So you visit Oregon. What was it about Oregon that made this be part of the, the next part of your plan? You know, it's today it's still quite collegial. I mean, we all say that. And uh, the, the ability to share information and, you know, learn early on if, if we all make better wine, the industry goes forward. Mm -hmm. and, uh, being here for, for now, making wine for, for almost 20 years, you know, this isn't a competition. You know, I, I am very blessed that I'm able to make the wine I love to drink. And we're able to sell it and, and, and make a, a, a life out of it. Um, and that's the thing is, is if you weren't able to craft your expression and make the wine you love to drink, why do it? You work so hard doing what we do. And I think it's just, it's, I think it's, I'm very blessed to be able to do what I do, so, yeah. So tell, tell me about the planning process then, and when you decided, you, you visit Oregon, you kind of have this flash of, this is what I want to do. Tell me about the next step about actually getting here and, and finding this space. Well, so, um, I graduated from the University of Colorado in 1990. And then that's really when I started to, to learn and, and um, my quest for wine came about. And then traveling to Oregon, visiting, IPNC was my first introduction, I believe it was either 90 or 91. And then from that became friends with people that were doing it and was able to come out and work a harvest here or there. Um, so in 1993, um, I wanted to go to the next step and really see what was going on in Oregon. So I, I moved to Portland and I went to culinary school for a year. And I worked at a couple wineries and my fate was sealed. <laughs> Uh, but being 24 years of age, I didn't have the resources, the capital to purchase land, but I still had connections where I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. So I moved back there and I opened a, a wine shop um, and the focus was education. Uh, we, did, we took clients overseas on buying trips. We had a supper club. So at the time, um, was kind of doing things that wasn't really being done in the area. 
and I was able to build that business up and sell it in the year of 2000 and that allowed my wife and I to move to Oregon, back to Oregon, and actually purchase the property that we're on today. Why this place? Why, so when we first started looking for land in the late 90s, um, we looked all over. And we had uh, several criteria that we were like, lots of boxes to check off. Mm -hmm. Um, big goal was we were going to do the endeavor with my in-laws. So we needed to get a property in which we could build a second dwelling on. And, um, you know, I looked high and low. Um, after looking for three plus years, living out of state, came to the realization unless we were here, it was never going to happen because the properties would, would just turn too fast. So my wife and I moved. Uh, we rented a house in Portland. And not being in Oregon but five months, we received the phone call that the property that we're on today was going on the market. Mm -hmm. So I drove down the, the next day and, and walked the property and that was it. You know, that was, that was the, the, the place. Mm -hmm. You know, where we are, Ribbon Ridge, wasn't established ABA at the time. But um, I knew that uh, neighboring vineyards and wineries made ex exceptional wine. And as long as the soil profile showed on our property to be promising, it was a done deal. And uh, three days later, a backhoe was on the property digging test holes, and, and it was done. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the orchard of 90 years that had the blight went away within six days, and um, the the vineyard was starting to play into the next season. So. And you were saying that this was hazelnuts before you got here. Yes, originally hazelnuts. Uh -huh. So I want to back up just a bit for before buying this. You said you, you do, you'd worked in a few wineries and a few harvests here in mm -hmm. Oregon. Tell me about that experience of getting on that side of wine for, for the first time. So um, when I was in Oregon in the early 90s, um, a dear friend, a mentor of mine is, is Matt and Holly Kinney. They have a vineyard called McKinley Vineyards. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they, they were so gracious to me and, and shared their, their knowledge and Working harvest with them, it was just, it was, it was an amazing experience. And then um, the other place I was able to work at is, was Rex Hill, which is at the time a little, a little bit larger. And I was able to do some hospitality work for them too. So it's, you know, we, we all have this vision of the wine industry. And in getting your foot in the doors was, you know, it's, it's never easy. But uh, once you do get in, you, you're just, wow. You know, this is, this is what I really want to do. And... Um, Given, I was been very fortunate. I've been given opportunities to, to learn from a lot of really talented, skilled people over the years. So, what were the biggest challenges for you? You found your site. You, mm -hmm. you kind of you, you got digging right away. You got started. What were the initial challenges in, in getting airs up and running? Okay, so at the time, um, I needed I could sell wine. I needed to learn how to make wine. So um, I started at Domains Ruin in two thousand. And I was very fortunate that I was, I was there for six years. And um, more or less, I learned to make wine under the direction of Veronique Drun. Mm -hmm. And um, the timing was just, uh, I, there again, I was, I was very fortunate. Um, you know, going, that was my first paid winemaking experience. And hired on as a seller hand, mm -hmm. and slowly working my way up through the chain of command, um, it was just, it was the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And um, I was able to, to learn everything from, from cellar work up to, you know, orchestrating a harvest, um, learning how to uh, pick decisions mm -hmm. uh, from managing fermentation to, uh, to labeling, bottling, you know, and then, then actually going out and selling the wine as well, so. What was your impression of the winemaking process once you started learning it from that perspective was it more than you expected was it less How, was it different you know it was yeah, i had lots of uh, lofty uh, ideas of, of what was going on and but, but you know the, the the ability to the thing that that i've always enjoyed being challenged and trying to figure stuff out and it seems like when you make wine you, there's always something to figure out and there's always, you know, typically there's, there's fluctuations of harvest, you know. There's, there's different characteristics of the growing season. Or it goes back to just, um, you know, that piece of equipment is not working. How do I make that work? Or, or you know, I, I need to do this. And so you just, 
you know, I think you're constantly being challenged as a human. Um, it's never dull, let's just mm -hmm. say. Yeah. So tell me about developing your winemaking philosophy and, and how you would describe your winemaking philosophy today. Well, um, you know, I, I fell in love with old world wines. You know, I always cut my teeth with wines from Europe. And being able to work with the Drouin family, um, you know, a lot of winemaking techniques and tradition goes back a long ways. Mm -hmm. um, but with that said, you know, innovation is, is always important too because without research and, and pushing forward, you're going to get stuck in a rut. Um, I would consider myself um, a winemaker, um, I focus on the vineyard. Um, I think that's critical. And, um, you know, regardless if you're making wine or if you're baking cookies or, or smoking a turkey, you know, you want great raw material. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that first and foremost, you, we have to be a great steward of, of our property. Um, you know, we're part of a couple different organizations, the Deep Roots Coalition, mm -hmm. which I'm very, really happy to be included with. And then uh, we're part of LIVE as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, more importantly is not just you know, it's, it's how do I make this place a better place than when I bought it? Mm -hmm. And having the ability to have my kids, my dogs, my family, visitors go out in the field any day and, and it's a very safe, healthy environment. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's critical. Um, but with that said, um, I'm a winemaker with kind of less intervention. You know, I, I feel like my job is to watch and monitor the wine. Um, and, and often the wine kind of tells you which direction it wants to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that as a winemaker, the biggest thing that I was, the challenge in the early years was to think that I always had to be doing something because that's just what you do, right? You always have to tinker. And um, we all have had wines, I think, over the years that have been tinkered with, you know, it just like, okay, it's okay just to relax and, and everything will work out. Um, but with that said, you can't just be complacent. Mm -hmm. You have to watch it, so. At what point in the process did you feel comfortable making that kind of decision in terms of, I need to watch this, I need to do something to this? Like, at what point do you feel confident in your own, uh, own abilities and own, own uh, um, sorry, I lost the word here, uh, wh what you've worked on previously, at what point do you feel comfortable with, with that? You know, I think it's just after uh, experience of, of a couple of vintages. And, you know, I was, I still remember vividly, um, I was at some of the wine events and uh, Christophe Fermier, a very prominent grower in Burgundy, had made the comment that the, the decision to do nothing is a decision to do something. And it's like, wow, you know, that, that just like hit me with a ton of bricks. Like that makes sense. And, um, you know, having the confidence to knowing that, that, that it's going to maybe step back and observe and to see what, which way it needs to go. Mm -hmm. But be ready to jump in if you need to, mm -hmm. you know. And you know, often when, when um, I'm conducting tastings, you know, sometimes people ask interesting questions. But you know, and often, you know, I think in human nature, we always look sometimes to the, the negative. Um, and, every, and sometimes it comes up like, well, what do you do when you have uh, a lot that gets, you know, sideways and you know, this and that. It's like, well, you know, really, if, if I'm doing my job accurately, we're, we're going to be there before that happens mm -hmm. and, and being able to um, address that. Mm -hmm. You know, and there, I have the good fortune making the amount of wine that we do, we're able to keep an eye on things. Mm -hmm. yeah. You brought up uh, live and, and deep roots. Why, why those uh, in particular? What about those uh, organizations appealed to you? Well, so like the Deep Roots Coalition, you, you know, I was exposed to wines from, from particularly regions in which irrigation is not, they just don't do it. You know, it's illegal in some areas. Um, and, you know, it's been proven that you can grow amazing grapes here in Oregon without the use of irrigation. And um, we just happen to live in a region in which, you know, that, that's a, it works. Um, temptation would be to drop that irrigation, you know, dig that well, throw up the drips and you know you're going to push your your vineyard into production much earlier mm -hmm. so financially it's it's a, a wise investment but um i think that like so many things with with growing grapes and making wine you you need to look at this as a longer term endeavor and be patient mm -hmm. and um by getting your vineyard established you know we're, we're better suited to deal with drought in those rainy years too mm -hmm. Because those vineyards that have you, you know, the overabundance of horizontal roots, you know, you run into moisture late in the season, 
that's going to go right up into the plant because once the ground gets saturated, it's, it's, it's going back to the grapes. Mm -hmm. So that I think can be a, a big problem, you know, and, and you know, even though that, that uh, you know, it's getting warmer, uh, our vineyards rarely show any st stress mm -hmm. through the growing season. You know, we have a, a fair amount of clay here in the soils here on Ribbon Ridge, and it really helps us retain that moisture later in the season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the deep roots, and then, you know, another thing, it's, it's a lot of like-minded friends that grow grapes, and, and you know, we're, we're trying to take care of, of our little part of the world. Mm -hmm. And living you know, where we live, everyone lives on a well, and we just have to manage, you know, manage the resource water. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned clay and Ribbon Ridge. Tell me a little bit more about Ribbon Ridge. It, obviously, it's become an AVA since mm -hmm. you've been here. Tell me about what's special about this place and, and uh, what its ter terroir is for, for you. So, to me, um, being able to have, have made wine off of, of different sites and different AVAs, um, what my take on Ribbon Ridge um, with the soil as well as the climate, um, to me, you often find that darker expression of Pinot Noir. So often you use descriptors of boysenberry, blackberry, blueberries. And then for myself, whenever I'm tasting um, blind and I come across a wine that has any of the baking spices, like cinnamon, clove, nutmeg, like, oh, I know where that's from. That's from close by here. And that is just a characteristic that I always pick up from Ribbon Ridge. Um, to my palate, um, when you jump just south of us to the Hill of Dundee, mm -hmm. To me, it, it happens to be more the red spectrum, um, often more of that roasted plum cherry component. Um, and we're so close, but such vastly different wines, which that, that's what I, I love about doing what we do, mm -hmm. is you can have a different site, and it can be not that far. You can have a different aspect, different elevation, mm -hmm. and then you can craft a totally different expression to Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And Ribbon Ridge, to me, um, wants to make kind of bigger expressions of Pinot Noir. So um, I've always loved finesse when it comes to Pinot Noir. So constantly trying to always put the brakes, pull the reins in to, to get as much elegance as we possibly can. And um, I think that uh, Veronique Duan really, really helped me kind of to, to figure out what needs to be done in, in fermentation as well as you know, the, the time and barrel elevage on, on to, to try to achieve that. So you mentioned early on that, that Pinot Noir was your passion. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious, A, why Pinot mm -hmm. Noir? And, and then B, when you decided to plant here, you obviously have your clones behind you on the wall here. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me how you chose what you wanted to do with sure. the site. So Pinot Noir, as, as I learned about wine, um, I kind of jumped the traditional kind of trajectory as, as people jump into wine. Um, you know, the cab thing never just got to me. I mean, I just, I just never found it. it it was not my calling, and, and I just went straight to Pinot Noir. And from that, it, you know, in the early on, as you learn about it, uh, you know, you, you can get kissed and then you can get swallowed, you know, in the same time. I mean, you really, you know, the, the understanding of Pinot Noir is very site specific and, and that it excels and, you know, not, not every continent in the world, it's, you know, it's, it's a tough one. But that's what brought us to Oregon. And um, with the youthfulness of the industry, as well as the, uh, the lifestyle that, that provided um, was a no-brainer. Um, and then from that, um, to me, Pinot really is the reflection of the site. I mean, I think it's, it's almost, Tawar shows up in, in all varietals, but to me, it, it's even more so with Pinot Noir more than any other varietals. And then the next, the segment way. Why you chose, how you chose what you wanted to plant here of, of the, the varieties. Clones. The clones, sure, oh yes. Um, so the way I went about it is I was fortunate enough to knock on the doors of my neighbors that had vineyards planted here previously mm -hmm. and sample what their expressions were from, from these soils and the climate. And that gave me a good understanding of, of what we might jump into. And I, I tried to, to, to um, offer a little diversity because, you know, they do ripen at different rates to manage different flavor profiles. Uh, you know, it's different size of the cluster, different size of the berries, um, red raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, uh, later harvest. You know, so to me, um, 
diversity is good mm -hmm. um, because what you know you might have uh, a weather you know as is the what Dijon 115 happens to be the first clone on our property to bud to bud out and it's, a, it's typically the first one to go through flowering and the first one to go through grass on so you know if, if we have some some crazy weather while that's going on I might not have as much of that block or that clone for harvest but then we have some diversity for the, the later stuff so you mentioned the space you have here and, and how flexible it is for you. So tell me about using it as, as a winery, as a tasting room, and, and then kind of how you've made the, the, the life cycle of, of the year of wine work here. Well, so when we built the second home on the, the property, my in-laws live on the house above. Uh, we, in essence, we took their basement away from them. Um, when I was the wine merchant uh, taking clients to the south of France, going to, to Burgundy, I was always in awe with, with the experience when the cave was actually beneath the, the home. So we thought, let's try that. You know, other buddies that have done it here in Oregon, um, Matt, Kinney at, uh, Matt Kinney at McKinley, and then as well as, as uh, Russ Rainey that did Evesham Wood originally. Um, same, same idea. Um, having the winery three quarters underground, it's the, the earth is very, it's a great insulator. So the winery itself is constantly 60 to 65 degrees year round. Um, you know, uh, if I was to advise somebody to, on doing this, just always overbuild because whatever space you make, you're never gonna have enough. Um, and that's, that's what comes to with wine. But um, you know, it, it's our space and I'm the one that makes the wine there. And, and so I just think it's a great, great idea and a great opportunity having it next door. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, with that said, uh, I do a lot of winemaking things outside as well because I think wine, to me, wine likes to be in and out. It, it likes to be exposed to the elements, you know, granted, not, not crazy uh, rain and stuff like that, but you know, often when we're doing things, you know, it's just nice to take it outside on a sunny day, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of like us humans, you know, it's getting the sun on your face is nice every now and then. And, and you know, I can't talk for wine, but I, I would imagine, you know, it wouldn't mind it as well, so. So tell me about, the, about your, your, your tasting setup here and, and, and how you, you said you do the tastings yourself here. So tell me about uh, that kind of how you set it up and, and, and what you're going for when you're, when you're doing a tasting with, with clients. So, you know, I, we always want the visitors to get the experience that, that, that I'm the person that makes the wine. So I should be the one presenting the wine and answering the questions. Because when it comes down to it, if, if I can't answer that question, the, the, you know, there's, there's an issue there. Um, and kind of going back to the, those former experiences in travel, I was always, you know, I got the most experience, the best tasting experience when we were able to talk to a principal or the, the person that made the wine or, or the, the, the person that grew the grapes. Mm -hmm. So I think you have a, a, the knowledge of, of of really what's going on. And you know, as, as a winemaker, as I look back upon it, you know, my, I think from making wine, you really don't know a site until you've made several vintages of that wine because uh, Mother Nature will often give you different opportunities. And then just knowing how, you know, the, the grapes react to those different growing seasons. Um, and having that kind of knowledge having the knowledge to know that oh, when, when so-and-so vintage and, and we, we tried this different technique to because we experienced this through the growing season, I think that that's important to share. Mm -hmm. And you know, when, when people come, I try to give a really thorough discussion of what we do. Um, you know, at times, uh, you know, I think maybe sometimes it goes deeper than people want, but you know, I, I feel like I can read the crowd pretty good. You know, I was like, hey, you know, they, they don't really want to know about this, you know, and, and, and uh, it's okay, you know, uh, let's have fun as well. Yeah. Since you're so close to that side of things, I'm curious how your customers have changed over the years. Are they, do they want more information than they used to want? Do they know more information than they used to know? Have they changed in any way like You know, that? I think that the, by, by doing it appointment as we do it, um, the, 
the client, the, the customer that comes, that takes the time to actually reach out and make that appointment, I mean, they're here for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they want to get that experience. And, you know, when people do come and they, they oh, you're the person that makes the wine, that's, you know, that, it's kind of an added bonus. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that the, the, the right people always kind of find us. Um, you know, the temptation would be, let's be open every day. Um, but with that said, our wine needs to be in balance. Our life needs to be in balance. Mm -hmm. So the, you, you've got to be able to love what you do. And it's okay to say no. You know, that, that I'm, I'm sorry that we're not available. You know, and, and maybe I'll have to get you next time you're in Oregon. But, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, having the confidence to be able to do that, that just, that's years of, of making and selling wine. Because when you first stop, first start, excuse me, it's like, oh, we got to sell, we got to sell, we got to sell. You know, but it's all going to work out. You know, just have the confidence that it will. So. <laughs> You mentioned uh, Mother Nature giving you a variety of opportunities, which I appreciate opportunities instead of challenges there as a word. I'm, I'm curious, uh, 2019, obviously a different year than we've seen recently. Tell me about this harvest and the opportunities. Well, so you. getting, so we've had a string of warm ones and uh, yeah, they make luscious, stark, rich, opulent Pinot Noir and they're great to drink. Um, but with that said, we had a warm growing season and then we had a little cooling effect in September and some rain. And to me, the 19s at this stage uh, show a lot of promise that we have a really nice finesse vintage. Um, the wines are gonna have a little bit lower alcohol, which um, to me is critical. Um, alcohol and Pinot Noir for my palate don't jive. When, so to, to Getting, I should say, when alcohol gets a little bit higher, mm -hmm. I think as a varietal Pinot Noir, um, it gets very present. And th that is another thing that, that I feel that I can do here since I live on the property, we taste the grapes daily. Mm -hmm. And um, often right before harvest, we're gonna be sampling quite a bit. You know, so sugar accumulation in these warmer years is easy. Um, but flavor is really what we're looking for, flavor development. And um, I've been able to, the last several years, uh, my kids and I go out every evening. Uh, we, that's, our, that's our dessert. So we eat, eat, eat grapes, eat grapes. And it's, it's really, you know, really amazing on, on how you can have sugar, sugar on Tuesday, sugar on Wednesday. And all of a sudden, Thursday evening, we're out there, we have sugar, but we have flavor. And um, I work with a, a smaller vineyard management company. So, if we had that flavor on Thursday, we're picking grapes on Friday. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think that's really a way where we can get the flavor quotient that we're looking for and still achieve lower alcohols, I think is critical. And so uh, with that said, 19, lower alcohols, great flavor. I'm, mean, you know, tasting the wines off the press, it just, you know, it, it's all primary at this stage, mm -hmm. but for making wine for almost 20 years, I, I think these wines are gonna be quite enjoyable. Um, I'm very excited about the vintage at this stage, so yeah. So I'm curious, uh, as you kind of look over, you've been, you say 20 years in, in, in Oregon, more or less, uh, what are the changes you've seen here in the Oregon wine industry? What have you, besides pure size, obviously, mm -hmm. but what else has, has changed by the industry since you become a part of it? You know, um, I think when we got our bond in, in 2002, um, there was 300 or less wineries here in the state, you know, and, and now we're, we're, if not to 800, we're soon to be over 800. So there has just been a sure increase of wineries in Oregon. Um, and, you know, looking at that, well, is that competition? No, it's not competition still, you know. We, I think that that we all have a story and, and how you uh, express what you do is, is important. And you know, it, you might spend more time and energy now to get your story out there, but that's like any business. I mean, regardless, things are gonna change. And I think that, um, you know, with the increase of numbers, it's helped market Oregon wine, not just in the Northwest, but you know, around the country as well as is around the world. So, you know, it's, the word is getting out there what 
what people are doing is, is working on quality. And, and that's, that's really the way the state has grown, is, is smaller growers can kind of focus on, on more qualitative issues. Um, and I don't, I don't see that changing, you know. People are gonna get bigger and they're gonna make more wines, but, but I think that through, you know, what we've learned as grape growers, um, we can we can actually manage that you know in the early years in Oregon you know 60s 70s and 80s there was a lot of fluctuation but I had the good fortune starting in, in the early 2000s that that people shared all those trials and tribulations mm -hmm. you know how can we become better grape growers how can we manage it in the winery and um, you know just making uh, the, the greatest beverage that we can is I think the end goal how has the outside perception of Oregon wine changed since you become a part of it? How has the outside of Oregon, the national, international reputation changed? Well, I think all, all to the good. You know, if you just surely look at the, the investment from, from people overseas investing in Oregon alone, you know, it's, 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 on, the, it's on the map. And it's only going to continue to go forward. Um, you know, and, and there again, just a handful of wine regions excel at Pinot Noir, and we happen to be in one of those wine regions. So, um, you know, I think that as as wine continues forward, you know, we see the ups and downs with the economy, mm -hmm. and we happen to be making, you know, a more expensive version of wine just because the economics of growing Pinot Noir is, as well as, you know, it's very site specific, and it just it's going to cost more to make Pinot Noir than anywhere else. But once you get bit by the bug, you know, like what we're doing in Oregon is really special. If we're able to achieve, you know, the, the richness of these warm vintages, but still throw that earth into there to, to get more than one dimension in the wine, I think it's, it's, it's critical. So uh, having the earth speak through your wines um, is, is, is important. And I still remember many, many years ago when I first started making wine, I was, I was pouring in Chicago or some, some, some other market. And it was a, a grand tasting and, and somebody came to the table and he goes, you know what, there's something in your wine that's just different. I, I can't put my finger onto it. So we had a conversation and he left and maybe 10 minutes later he came back. He goes, I got it, I, I just, I, it, it, I smell it and it reminds me of fresh turned dirt. And, and to me, I was like, whoa, that's great. You know, I thought it was a great compliment. And he's like, yeah, but I don't like it. It's like, but that's okay. That's what wine's all about, you know? It, it, that, that person's stage of, of, of their, the wine, you know, what they, you got to drink what you like. But, but that wasn't calling to him. But I took it as a compliment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you can get the earth as well as the fruit, to me, that's what Oregon Pinot Noir is all about. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it so distinctly different than so many other wine regions. Mm -hmm. And you know, to, to this day, maybe that person you know loves the earth and his wine. Who knows? But it, it doesn't matter though, you know, because um, everyone is wired differently. You know, you know, somebody might like mustard, somebody might like ketchup. But there's no right or wrong answer. It's just you, you got to do what you like. So. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as you look ahead then for Oregon wine? You, you mentioned you, you think it's going to stay similar to, it, to what it is as it grows. Uh, what do you see as you look, say, 10 years down the road? You know, I think that there'll be even more and more, you know, I think that more sites are going to be discovered um, and that uh, we can grow Pinot Noir in, in regions and maybe we didn't think that we could if it continues to get warmer as, as it is. Um, I think as a vineyard, grape grower, we have to address that. And, and how are we going to slow the, the, the train out? You know, it's got to slow it down because, you know, we don't want to be picking grapes really, really early. And how do we extend the, the, the growing season? Whether it be different uh, playing with the trellis, you know, do different crop management. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely has to be addressed. Um, but with that said, I think the more that we could spread the word about quality Oregon Pinot Noir, it, it, that's important. Because every uh, season that goes by, we see tours from all over. Mm -hmm. And you know, why are you here? Why? Because I, I was exposed to Oregon Pinot Noir, um, and then I just wanted to see what else was going on out here. So I think that um, the state has done a good job with tourism, promoting. Um, we could always do better. You know, and, and then with that said, you know, the wine business has changed dramatically. 
you look at um, how do you market yourself. We didn't have the discussion about social media, you know, 10 years ago. I mean, that wasn't a discussion, but, but, but if you're not in there now, it's, you know, you're, you're really limiting yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that as time goes on, technology changes. That's what you got, you've got to embrace it because it's, if not, you get left behind, so. And you had a little bit of an advantage coming in from a sales background, so that was, that's usually the part people complain about in the industry. Yeah, but well, it's something the old, you had, had, you had some experience in. It's the old joke that the, you know, most winemakers, the making of the wine is the easy part. Uh, the selling of the wine is the more challenging part. Um, yeah, so I've, I've been able to work retail as well as wholesale and now production, so I feel fortunate that I've been able to kind of work all the different aspects of it. Um, and and, and it, it really helps relay in the story. Um, and. And I think the being able to judge, you know, what, what kind of experience people are looking for. You know, at times, you know, when people are really into it, like, hey, let's go in the vineyard. Let's let's go. And, and, and I'm shocked that so many times people will say, well, I've never been in a vineyard. Like, what? <laughs> I mean, you have you love wine. You've got this passion of wine that have never been. Well, let's do something about that. You know, and you know, if it's close to harvest, let's try some grapes. You know. And when you get people in there, when, you know, we haven't got through Barrison, I'm like, oh, let's try grapes. Like, no, 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 you really don't want to do that. You know, like, <laughs> that's not a good idea. But um, some people still do, so. <laughs> so as you, as you kind of look back uh, 20 years in, what are, you, what are you proudest of from your time in the Oregon wine industry? What would I be the proudest of? Um, I would say that, you know, as, as Winemakers, um, you know, when you do have that challenging vintage and still able to craft an ex exceptional wine, I think that that's, that's where I feel very, very fortunate, you know. And, and, I, and I think that kind of going back to that being patient thing, mm -hmm. you know, I remember vintages like 7 and, and 11 and, you know, and then and sometimes some of the press would just pan the entire vintage. like. Let us make the wine first and see where it goes. You know, there, there have been vintages that have been challenging that, that amazing wine comes out of. And, um, you know, just forced, you know, looking back at, at 11, you know, I still remember waking up in September and just the rain, 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 like thinking, we're never going to be making wine this year. And it just all worked out. You know, October came and the, the, the skies somewhat cleared up, and we had some a uh, couple nice weeks of, of weather, and, and you know we started picking grapes in the, I think the third week of October. And granted, um, you know sometimes those vintages take longer to really show us what they're all about, mm -hmm. but uh, they're glorious right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you pop eleven, you're like, wow, this is really cool. Yeah. As as a, as a winemaker, do you prefer a year like that where it is a challenge you have to overcome, or do you prefer a like a 20, 2016, 17 where it's more of a turnkey? Yeah, I like both. You know, let's be fair. You know, I, you don't always have to be challenged. You know, and, and <laughs> like I said, yummy, scrumptious, and delicious are good vintages. You know, too. So, um, you know, it's but then that there again, that's where we can play and we can experiment too. And I think that uh, you know, any given. Vintage, I'm not changing the house style, but you know, talking to peers, talking to, hey, I tried this last year and this is the result. I think that's what keeps it fresh. Mm -hmm. Always, always kind of looking at a, a different as aspect. And then there again, trying wines from from your name. I mean, that's the worst thing a winemaker can do is get cellar palate. You got to drink other people's wine because uh, you know it's that's there's a world of amazing stuff out there. Mm -hmm. And I think that by talking with people and trying different wines, that's how you learn. What do you see as you look ahead for the future here at Ayers? What do you, where do you hope to be in, again, say 10 years? You know, so we've grown um, over the years. Uh, I strive to make between four to 5,000 cases annually. And that is a very, very good spot for us. Um, it's, it's a spot that, that we can manage um, within the constraints, the physical constraints within our winery. But then there again, it's how we, we keep the winery, uh, as my wife and I, as the two employees. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very, very important that uh, we have a business uh, that, that allows us the opportunity to have the lifestyle that we're looking for. But then there again, um, you know, I am not a slave to it where uh, I get to spend the time with my family. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, like I mentioned earlier, it's about balance. Mm -hmm. And so we have, 
achieve where we need to be, and then the, the goal is, okay, just go sell all that wine. Okay. So, um, you know, we, we feel that we, we make a great wine and we fairly price it. And so it sells out every vintage and we just move on to the next. Um, so it's, it, it, it's working uh, quite well and we're really happy with where we're at. So. Do you have any, I know winemakers like to constantly tinker and try other, try new things. Do you have any interest in a uh, different kind of variety, different kind of clone? Are you pretty happy with what, what you have right now? You know, um, I, we still have roughly four or five acres on the property um, in which we could plant out. Um, and then uh, all of the A grade land would be planted out. Um, you know, I run into problems with space here in the, in the cellar. Um, in you know, granted, we could always build or, or lease another space. Um, so, with that said, um, I, I still I, I buy a little bit of fruits as well, and, and have a lease on another property. Um, I like that there's diversity from where the fruit comes from, but I think that there are maybe a couple uh, clones as well as uh, plants, maybe a different varietal. I make a little bit of Gamay Noir uh, from a friend's vineyard, and um, I think that. Having uh, the Gamay, our, our good friends, uh, Doug and Melissa over at Brickhouse, mm -hmm. uh, that would, you know, Gamay does great here on Ribbon Ridge, so it's kind of a no-brainer that I should, that's another thing that we're, we're toying with planting here, so, yeah. So if you, if someone came to you and said they were interested in getting the Oregon wine industry, what mm -hmm. would your words of wisdom to them be? You know, I think that the, the over the years, the, it was always that first job, getting your foot in the door and being willing to to do whatever that needs to be whether you know so many of us come to this industry later in life after maybe a successful career doing this and that and just coming to grips like okay it's okay to go and do work that nobody else wants to do and get paid nothing you know and so it's 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 i think that you to get your foot in the door you check your ego and that's like probably any other industry though too. But then from that, it's all about the connections that you develop and the experience that you have from, from this seller and working with this winemaker and, and, or this grape grower. And um, it, you, granted, you, everyone wants to be a winemaker at the beginning, but I, you know, I, I am a creature that, that I learned through doing and sometimes that just takes a little bit longer and you just have to be patient. Um, you know. When I was at Druin, um, we were able to have interns from all over the world, and that was a great experience as well, too. So uh, if, if people are able to do that, I think that I would highly recommend that, um, to be able to, just to work a harvest somewhere else, um, because you're going to get a different way to look at it. And, you know, we're all making wine, but there's lots of different ways that you can make wine. And, and you know, we have our house style, um, but there's lots of other things that you could do. Um, so don't give up, yeah. <laughs> Just be patient. I think that's the biggest thing, yeah. Patience and balance, right? Yeah. Patience and balance. Yes, okay. yeah. All right. Okay. That's all the questions that I have for you today. Uh, oh, great. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have, anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? Uh, did I mention my in-laws? Because I don't want to forget them. You mentioned that they're living upstairs. Yeah, yeah, but they're partners as well. So, well. yeah, I mean, I would like to kind of make sure I don't, because that's... <laughs> I mean, that's not cool, so. <laughs> it doesn't have to be the Brad show, so, yeah. We, could, we could more like, it's a family endeavor here, and, and I like to, to definitely express that. Absolutely. And then with that said, my wife, um, you know, she does just as much, she does all the marketing for us, she does all the administrative stuff. So without that aspect of, of our business, you know, it, you know, that's how we go forward, you know. Um, I definitely, uh, Always want to get that out there too. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so of much course. for your time today, for your answers, for yes. your uh, for your stories, and I'll go ahead and let you off the hook here.